So let's read Jeremiah 20, 14 through 18. And this says, Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, A child is born to you, a son. May that man be like the towns the Lord overthrew without pity. May he hear wailing in the morning, a battle cry at noon, for he did not kill me in the womb with my mother as my grave, her womb enlarged forever. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my days in shame? Is that cheery or what? (laughs) So this is from the prophet Jeremiah. Prophet Jeremiah, who spent almost 40 years preaching to Israel, pleading with them to turn back to the ways of the Lord, and he did this without a whole lot of converts. And yet he knew his call, and he knew his obligation before the Lord, largely because God was his passion. You wouldn't know it from that passage, but God was his passion. So he lived in the space of obedience and knowing God was going to bring results, even if Jeremiah wasn't going to be around to see that happen. But in that, he was also close enough to God to be honest about how he was feeling and to lash out at God in his grief and his confusion. Speaking of grief and confusion, we also have Job. And I have to tell you, just thinking about this story makes me kind of confused and angry with God because we know people who are doing it all right and things don't always go well. So here's a man who was so godly that in a conversation about the state of the world, God held him up as an example to Satan and said, yeah, but look at my servant Job. He's faithful to me no matter what. To which Satan replied, are you serious? You've insulated him against any type of adversity. Give me a crack at him and I guarantee he will renounce you. So God does just that with the caveat that Satan can't kill Job, which has always been kind of confusing to me because if Job was dead, he'd be in heaven and, you know, then kind of negates everything. But anyway, Satan proceeds to destroy every single thing that brings joy to Job, including his wiping his kids out in a storm who just happened to be all partying together in the same place, and then leaves Job covered literally from head to toe in boils, at which point Job basically retreats to a corner and is just kind of scraping at his skin with a broken shard of pottery. To recap, this is a man who has lost literally everything, his vast wealth, his children, his health, and yet he refuses to turn his back on God. Job 2, 11 through 13, we're going to read this. It says, when Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. And this, obviously, this is exactly what should be happening. This is what we should be doing as community. This is an example for us. And I know that we have all seen this type of response and action. We've seen it in each other individually, and we've seen it in the body, in in the church, collectively. But we also live in a world that is demanding and can be intensely stressful, and sometimes we hardly have the bandwidth to deal with our own stuff. And even though we picture things as being simpler for people, or at least I do, people who lived hundreds or thousands of years ago, I imagine that life has always been difficult because we've always been living with other people. And it was likely that way for Job's friends, who we can gather from like the 20 subsequent chapters that they spend reprimanding him, may also have had a little bit of of envy going on. So after that seven-day period of grace for Job's grieving, we see his friends already, seven days into this guy losing everything, already becoming exasperated, and the responses begin to change. Job's friend Eliphaz starts it off by saying in Job 4, 4 through 6, 
Your words have supported those who stumbled. You have strengthened faltering knees, but now trouble comes to you and you are discouraged. It strikes you and you are dismayed. Should not your piety be your confidence and your blameless ways your hope? And he also questions whether Job brought disaster on himself through some sin, saying in Job 4, 7, and 8, Consider now who being innocent has ever perished. Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. So one of the reasons that this story is there in the Bible is to call out this very human and very problematic response. But it's also there to remind us that sometimes bad things do just happen. And no matter what that reason is, our job isn't to respond with platitudes or by trying to guide or dictate the responses of those in crisis. At the end of, this, of the book of Job, after a lot of back and forth between Job and the friends, God finally speaks, affirming that there are things that just are too deep and unknowable for us to ever comprehend. But God also makes clear that what he does expect is that we provide for each other community and compassion. Job 42, 7 and 8 says, After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. My servant Job will pray for you, and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So he calls that superior attitude folly. Now, in the majority of our day-to-day -day circumstances, we aren't dealing with the level of tragedy or depression experienced by Job. We are often existing in this land of mediocrity, where nothing is terrible, but it's not necessarily that amazing either, and we have moments of genuine elation where we feel like that room without a roof, and we have some significant lows, but for the most part, it's pretty much just okay. And ironically, because there's nothing terrible going on, or nothing so great that we're kind of watching for the rug to be pulled out from under us. And do you know what I'm talking about? Where things are going so well, you almost have that feeling that you have to be in extra prayer because the rug might get pulled out from under you. So anyway, when there's nothing that terrible and nothing that great going on, this can be the very place that we are in danger of letting our guard down of letting in or even accommodating things that steal our joy. Ephesians 1, 3 through 10, and stick with me because this is, a, this is a theologically deep passage. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So I want to make a couple of points about this passage. First of all, whenever I can, I use scripture that addresses us as Christ followers. Um, I, I use translations that convey that intended gender inclusivity. Because like here in, in verse 5, sonship is not inclusive for those of us who don't identify as male. But I retained that term sonship because at this time and in this culture, if you weren't a son, you were not eligible to be an heir. And to change that, 
you had to be legally adopted as a son. So sonship here is a legal term indicating the status of someone who had the full privileges and all the happiness that comes with that of inheritance. The other thing with this passage is that the inheritance it talks about is that huge blessing. It's the culmination of that true God-ordained happiness. But it's not entirely actualized until there is unity brought to all things in heaven and on earth. Which means that even though we have both temporal, meaning right here and now, and eternal protection and provision, it's not always going to feel like it, and it's not always going to play out that way. And because we live in a fallen world where sin and corruption not only exist, but a lot of the time prevail, it's not always going to look like it. Which means we have to make even more of an effort to ensure that we stay cognizant of our place and our power as heirs to the privilege of knowing Jesus as those who get to participate in doing the work of the kingdom here on earth. But there are a lot of things vying for our attention that if they can snatch us away from focusing on God can render us not only ineffective but disrupt our happiness and the happiness that we are supposed to be part of bringing to others. And I think for many of us, actually I should probably say for all of us, we are happiest when we are consistently in the word, meaning that we are reading and absorbing our Bibles, and when we are more focused on the things of God than on the things of the world. But back to that irony thing, this is counterintuitive, because I don't know about you, but when I'm thinking about having a great time or having some relaxing downtime, I am not picturing reading my Bible or studying scripture. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. So this past week, an incredible Bible teacher named Beth Moore, who I've followed for years but haven't really been tracking with lately, has been back on my radar, and I've spent almost every day this week listening to her sermons. And the reason she's back on my radar is that because as a Southern Baptist female teacher, she has received varying degrees of flack for being what is arguably the best preacher in that denomination. And she has deflected many of these attacks over the years by insisting that she is a women's Bible study teacher. But for the past 10 years or so, maybe longer, as her reputation has grown, she now has the ability on her own to fill entire arenas. And while Beth Moore still insists on referring herself to herself as a women's Bible study teacher, a number of men who don't have gender hang-ups and are simply interested in good teaching don't care what she calls herself. They're just showing up to hear her teaching, which has some insecure men within her own denomination having kind of a freak out about all of the attention she's getting, and I am always here to support a good gender-based freak out. <laughs> so, as we are at Mission Gathering. She's worth watching, so check her out. But I'm telling you this story because watching her consistently over the last week has been kind of transformative for my level of peace and spiritual awareness, and it's genuinely increased my own happiness. But even in this place of spiritual edification, one of my biggest distractions is this kind of ADD desire and pursuit of information. So I want to know things. And while I do end up knowing a lot of things, it also pulls me away from things I should be focused on. So right in the middle of watching one of these sermons, and I don't mean a sermon that's playing in the background, I mean a sermon where I am zoned in and taking notes and making life and ministry applications, I all of a sudden go, I wonder where she's at with the issue of inclusion and reparative therapy. So as most of us know, this kind of pursuit of information, especially when it entails getting on the internet, which is a big issue for me, has the power to become a 45-minute or all-day rabbit hole. And 
it will totally disrupt where our focus should be. And really, I need to look up where Beth Moore is at with LGBTQ inclusion. She's doing everything she can as a Southern Baptist just to tow party lines. Although, I do want to say she is coming, and one of, the, one of the things that's happened with her in this whole disruption is she is calling out by these words, saying, using the words sexism and misogyny when it comes to people opposing her teaching and what God, and she never takes credit for it, she always credits God, so she's doing pretty good at not towing party lines. Anyway, more importantly here, I was willing to step away from that desperately needed spiritual nourishment, from that joy in and connection to God that I hadn't felt in a while, and I was willing to give it up to focus on some differences of opinion with someone who has dedicated her whole life to studying the word and imparting the hope that comes from that. I was willing to accommodate a distraction and dissension that would serve no purpose except for to steal me away from God's lap. And I'll tell you what, I do that frequently. I am frequently off on those rabbit trails of what else can I learn. And this got me thinking about all of the things in our lives that take precedence over time with God, things that leave us so much less fulfilled than the things we know we should be prioritizing, things for which we actually have a spiritual hunger. So they may be a little bit different for each of us, but they likely include reading the Bible and journaling, maybe doing a Bible study workbook, joining a small group, maybe showing up for Wednesday night contemplative service or living waters. These are all things that I've had discussion with different people here about knowing that I really should do that. I know that I need it. If you are being pulled in any or all of these directions, I promise you that if you make that a priority, you will find actual joy and you will be so much better equipped, not just for ministry, but for life and for relationships. Isaiah 55 2 says, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest affair. So this is obviously not just about food. This is about what we consume and how it affects us and how we utilize our resources. With whatever we take in, do we come away with in all areas, physically, emotionally, spiritually, do we come away stronger and better equipped to handle whatever is coming our way? Or do we end up compromised or weaker or at a disadvantage? And this is not as black and white as we might be tempted to make it. Whether we are talking about food or what we consume on TV or the company we keep or how we spend our recreational time or the music we listen to, it's not indulgence itself that is detrimental. Getting together with friends, going out to eat, maybe having a drink or eat some cheesecake or a slab of ribs or whatever brings you happiness, this can be therapeutic. And we can find a space to minister even in this type of fellowship. But if we eat the cheesecake and the ribs and some ice cream and some mashed potatoes and top it off with a toxic diet Coke, and it causes us to arrive home bogged down with guilt and remorse and not to mention nauseated, that's a problem. If one drink turns into three or 17 and we do and say things that make us look bad and maybe even destroys the inroad and that connection of witness that we are hoping to have with those around us, we are sabotaging not only our happiness but our obligation to be ministers in all spaces because we are a royal priesthood. So I want to share something that I heard just last night from my friend Beth Moore. She should be my friend. I hope she is someday. <laughs> it was a word I knew I had to share with you, and it had me revising this message last night and early this morning and made Jocelyn super happy um, because she runs our slides. Anyway... Beth Moore was preaching about Jacob and Esau and came to Genesis 27, 42, which says, 
But the words of her elder son Esau were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, Your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. So there's a whole lot of family baggage here that we do not have time to get into. But the important thing to know is that Esau had felt wronged and marginalized and on the defense for most of his life. And the thought of killing his brother is where he found comfort. And Beth Moore's point was that how we comfort ourselves, how we console ourselves in our distress says who we are. So out of all the things we have talked about here, this may be the most important takeaway, the most important thing for you to consider in the week ahead. Because that whole thing about how we comfort ourselves in distress, how we think we are making ourselves happy, is a crucial consideration for who we are as followers of Christ and for who we want to be. Our song for this week, Happy, starts off with the line, it might seem crazy what I'm about to say. We're going to read 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Um, and it says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. So, I'm kind of freaking out because, oh, there it is. Part of my notes were missing. <sighs> so, this can sound crazy to us. We do not know specifically what Paul was referring to in this passage. The speculation I have heard most commonly is that it was impaired vision. And that would be difficult no matter what. But especially tragic as a scribe in a kind of pre-corrective lenses culture, or possibly he was dealing with depression. And as I began researching, I found it interesting how different people and different faith tra traditions translated this, quite possibly in response to their own hang-ups. So many of the reformers, including Luther and Calvin, thought he dealt with a temptation to unbelief or a crisis of faith, and the Catholics thought he had issues with piety. But even more relevant than what Paul's specific issue was is an awareness not only that things get in the way of pursuing and prioritizing spiritual sustenance, but realizing that our weaknesses should make us so much more dependent upon God and that we can find solace and gratitude and safety in that dependence. So as counterintuitive as it sounds, our greatest weaknesses can actually be a source of happiness and of fortification because they cause us to focus on and to rely upon God Psalm 37.4 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So this is a pretty well-known verse, and we tend to think that it means if we follow God and we do what God wants, then God will bless us with all of the things that make us happy. But what this verse really means is that when we prioritize following God, God transforms our hearts and begins giving us the desire for the things God wants us pursuing, that God actually forms our happiness. So as we think about these things, we're going to get ready to move into our three minutes of silence. So as we are thinking, this really is, so this is a, a wonderful, if you're new here, this is just a time to empty yourself of kind of like, Pastor Lee did this morning, like to take those deep breaths and empty ourselves of those things that are distracting. But as you have this time, 
I want you to, to be open to the Holy Spirit speaking to you about what makes you happy, about where you find your joy, and maybe what you should be letting go of to have genuine joy that comes from Jesus. And I also, I want to encourage us, as we are around people who are grieving and who are living real life, that we allow space for grief and anger and just reconciling ourselves to God, allowing others to reconcile themselves to God in God's timing and in a way that's going to bear fruit. Because that's the bottom line with all of this is how it bears fruit in our, that everything we experience ends up bearing fruit in some way. The word of the Lord and the work of the Lord never returns void but rarely does it look like, like we want it to. So I'm going to ask you to put both feet on the ground, move your phone away from you so it doesn't vibrate and distract you. And again, let's just take that, that breath in and exhale. And one more cleansing breath in and exhale.